Welcome, welcome to the evening show with Jackie Brambles, where this week we are marking the 38th anniversary of the most legendary live gig of all time, Live Aid. Tonight, a man who played two gigs that night, one on stage at Wembley Stadium to an audience of, what, 75,000 plus the billions tuning in around the world, and the other on a patch of grass backstage to an audience of two superstars. You can hear that story and many more as we catch up with Howard Jones, who I last saw when he performed at Greatest Hits Radio live at the Palladium. Oh, hi. Hi, Jackie. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. It's, it's nice to speak to you uh, after enjoying uh, your performance at Greatest Hits Radio live, which was fantastic. Oh, great. Oh, no, it was, it was a real pleasure to do that. I really, um, I really enjoyed it. It was great. Great band and, uh, and, and lovely audience. Fantastic. Well, listen, thanks for joining us. You don't have a lot of downtime right now, I know. You're starting a tour of the US with Culture Club imminently, uh, then off to Japan and back here for a full UK tour of your own, which kicks off in October. I sense, Howard, you're a man who likes to stay busy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. It's going to be busy again. If it's OK with you, we'd like to kind of go go back a bit, well, before before we all heard of you in the 80s, to, to sort of figure out what the musical influences were and the memories that that still resonate with you um so tell us tell us a little bit about growing up in your house was it a very musical household it was it was a musical household my my parents uh were welsh and um and they both they both sang and so uh when we were kids when we went to visit relatives and 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 um and friends in wales we were expected to to perform you know either a poem or play the piano for them or sing a song so it was like part of our right. life as, as, as kids. I had three brothers and we sort of formed a band. We used to do Beach Boys songs and do the harmonies and stuff. Like music was just, you know, part of our lives, really. And, and, and did you sort of, what sort of music would, would you be growing up around? What sort of things were your mum and dad into? Well, well they, would, they, would, they, would, they were uh, both Welsh speakers, so they, they would sing in Welsh. So we got this sort of traditional Welsh songs right. and, and Welsh hymns. And then um, my mum was was a keen radio listener, and so we all, you know, she always had the um, um, it was the home service back then when I was a tiny yeah. kid, and so I got to hear all the you know all the sixties bands and you know the tremolos and the Stones and the, and the Beatles um, coming out of the radio because we we didn't have a record player or anything; it was only the radio was the source of yeah. that music. So. Yeah. Here comes my baby from 1967, hit for the tremolos, a favourite of Howard Jones' mum back in his childhood days. Do you remember the first single you'd ever have, you know, saved up your hard-earned pocket money for and gone gone and purchased? Yes, I. Um, well, I mean, the first album was 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 Blood, Sweat and Tears, and I'm just trying to think what the first single was. Um, oh yes, it was the it was the Mighty Quinn was the first single that I bought. Oh wow. Yeah, come on with that. Come on with it. You ain't seen nothing like the mighty Queen. Yeah, that, I can't even remember the band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it was very exciting to get that for those music, you know? Manfred Mann, the mighty Quinn. And as you said, you grew up with brothers. Did you all have similar tastes and sort of nicking each other's records or, or, or was it quite different um, tastes and music? Well, you know, I, th I think I was the sort of, because oh, I was the eldest, um, you know, I was the first one to have everything. And so, um, I mean, I think really we, 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 you know, because, you know, we didn't grow up in a wealthy, wealthy family. So we didn't, we didn't have, you know, hardly any records. So again, it was them um, listening to the radio and, and then we would, you know, try and try and recreate the the things we heard, like by doing, you know, covers of the of the Beach Boys tracks and and trying to do those harmonies. Because in in Wales, it is a kind of thing, you know, to to harmonise and and it's a fantastic tradition. So we 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 did that with our pop records, and it was great. When you were sort of, you know, becoming sort of a stroppy teenager and and you know, perhaps more of a grown up and. Did you did you have a sense that music was going to be your life? Yeah, I, I was. I'm at, at the age of seven. I I started to learn the piano. My parents really wanted me to to learn the piano. I wasn't sure whether I did myself, 
Um, and my first couple of years of, you know, learning, you know, how to play classically. Yeah. Um, were quite painful, you know. I, I the the teacher I, the teachers I had were a bit sort of stuffy and a bit boring for me as a seven year old. Um, I'd rather be out playing football or you know playing cricket outside with my <laughs> friends. Um, yeah. But then there was a point came when I when I was nine when I, I was I think it was the I was, we were watching the um, Eurovision Song Contest and Puppet on a String won it, and I went to the piano and I played the tune of 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 Puppet on a string by ear, and that was it. It was like some, something switched on in my brain <laughs> at that point. I realised, oh yeah, I can hear a tune and I can I can play it on the piano. This is amazing. Wow! And so then the struggle was keeping me away from the piano because I was absolutely obsessed. You know, four hours a day banging out tunes and also doing my classical practice. And you know, when I should have been out playing football, if you know what I mean, you know, but yeah. it got have paid off in the end. But. Like a puppet on a string. Sandy Shaw, puppet on a string, Eurovision Song Contest winner in 1967 and the catalyst for Howard Jones to pursue a life in music. And we will be back with more great conversation from Howard next. Welcome back to our great conversation on the evening show. It's just you, me, Jackie Brambles, and tonight's very special guest, Howard Jones, having a good old natter. Uh, so before the break, Howard, you were describing how you discovered at a pretty young age that you had this incredible ear for music. You could just listen to a song and pretty much just go off and play it. So were you seen back then as something of a, of a child prodigy by those around you? It was funny because at, at school, the, um, the music... A teacher wouldn't wouldn't let me do uh, what it, what was A levels. Then he, I wanted to do music A level, and he he didn't like me because I was a bit of a you know a rock and roller and an outsider. Right. And he didn't believe that I'd got you know grade eight piano and stuff like that. So this just made me super determined to I get into music college, and I went to the Royal Northern College in in Manchester. Um, and um, you know, did two and a half years there, and they and they said when I when I did my audition that I played Bach with a jazz swing, which I'm really proud of. <laughs> and I'm, I'm shocked that they let me in actually, but they, uh, you know, they did. And and what was that experience like? Whether you know, were you sort of in you know paradise because you were surrounded by people who were as immersed and as obsessed as you were with music and lots of different influences and genres that people were into. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I quickly realised that I was never going to be a you know a concert pianist um, because there was people there who were just like unbelievable you know players. Um, I mean, my thing was 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 writing my own music. Uh, but what what was great was the sort of subculture around around the college, which was lots of bands. And I I played in a band called Bicycle Thieves, and I got yeah. uh, I, I got a job playing on Radio Piccadilly, um, playing covers during the during the night from two a.m. to six a.m. in the morning. Every twenty minutes, I had to play a, a cover. So. Um, you know that was that was that was really. Exciting. I mean, my um my favourite one was I did a, a complete version of um, Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, oh my god! Which, which took <laughs> ages to learn. Um, and then I started doing experimental stuff because they had a little studio in there, and um, I remember getting some complaints from, you know, late night security guards listening to the radio saying like, "What? Is, what's going on? What's this?" <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, there's, I guess there wasn't that many people listening, so it wasn't um, too bad. Is this the real life? Is this just. You don't let him go! This is not. We will not let you go! Let him go! How did you manage to do all the different parts of Bohemian Rhapsody live on your own? It was. It, I, I wish I'd I wish I've got a recording of it um, now. Um, it was just yes, just you know, trying to get all the tunes in. It took me it took me quite a few weeks to, to put it together. I was very proud of it when I when I played it. It is an extraordinary song, isn't it? Absolutely amazing, isn't it? Incredible. Unbelievable. It's like a classical piece, really. And um with all these amazing different genres, you know, joined together. Incredible. 
just backtracking slightly, when you were sort of either at the, at the music college or there or thereabouts, was there a, what was the first gig that you went to see as an audience member of somebody that we would know um, that sort of blew your mind and you thought, oh, my God, that's, that's something special? Well, I mean, I mean, going right back to the first gig I saw, um, I saw The Who, um, The Trogs, and the 1910 Fruit Gum Company, which um, is the most unusual bill you could imagine. Yeah. Um, and they, I mean, I, I don't even know whether they had a hit in, in, in the UK. It was a, a song called Yummy, Yummy, Yummy. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like this. Um, but, um, but then The Who, you know, absolutely blew me up. The loudest thing I'd ever heard. And then they smashed up all their instruments at the end. Why don't you all... It was, it was, and then the trogs were just, you know, absolutely fantastic as well. So I then got to uh, go to the Isle of Wight Festival in, in 1970 and, and saw Jimi Hendrix and I saw The Doors and oh my goodness. Saw, uh, you know, Emerson, Lake and Palmer and Joni Mitchell. And it was like, this is what I want to do. You know, this is what I, this is what I want to do. How could you want to do anything else? Hello. The Doors with Hello, I Love You from 1968 and performing for a young Howard Jones at the legendary Isle of Wight Festival in 1970. So when did you sort of start to get attention? When did people start to pay attention and, you know, there was whispers of record labels taking interest and things like that? How did that all come together? You know, I, it was, I was supposed to do four years at the, at the Royal Northern College of Music um, and I realised, no, this wasn't for me. And I left... Um, after two and a half years, and my, my piano teacher begged me to stay. He said, "You know, join the join the composer's course." As I played him some of my pieces, and I said, "No, my mind's made up. I've, I've got to get on with my own." So I went back to live with my parents um, in, in near High Wycombe, and I got this idea for doing a one man electronic band. You know, so um, because somebody lent me a, um, a drum machine, and I started playing piano to you know to the beats on the on the drum machine, and I thought. Hmm, this is interesting. I could add some keyboards to this and add a little sequencer. And I put it all together and I thought, well, I don't know if anybody's ever done this before. You know, it was very exciting. So I started doing gigs. Yeah. I started doing gigs when that nobody came to. Um, <laughs> and then gradually um, people started to turn up. And it, it, it soon I was like filling the local, local pubs, the Nags Head and High Wycombe, and we were taking coach loads of people around the country to tiny little gigs. You know, send off demos to the record companies, got totally rejected by everyone and all the publishers. Really? And then they'd think, oh, yeah, one man electronic band, you must be joking. How is that ever going to work? Um, and then there was one guy, Paul Conroy. Um, who later went on to run, um, the, the, you know, the whole of the Virgin label. He got it, you know, and um, he he believed in me. And he was with uh, Warner Brothers at the time. And um, so they got right behind me and um, they really wanted to make make it all a big success. And that's what they did. And it was, it, I was, I felt so fortunate, you know, the, to find the right place for me and my music. Who would have been your peers at that time who perhaps were a couple of steps ahead of you maybe you know as you were recording your stuff they they had already released it they were sort of on you know i remember um f hearing for the first time new song which was the first single yeah on on round table on radio one and um and gary newman was one of the people <gasps> you know listening to it oh he was a bit of a techno god really yeah, ex exactly and 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 he and he said i think this is going to be a huge hit i think it's great oh. and and at that moment i i thought oh that's i've always been grateful to him i've, I've never met him either i've always been really grateful for that because it gave me quite a boost of confidence you know um with my first single I've Number three in 1983, Howard Jones' debut hit single, new song. Listen, if it's got Gary Newman's seal of approval, what more do you need? 
Uh, we will be back to hear more from Howard's musical memories, including that iconic day at Live Aid. That's coming up next. Welcome back to the great conversation on the evening show. Howard Jones is here. And before the break, we played your first ever hit new song, which made it all the way to number three in 1983. Do you remember, did it did it go gangbusters up the charts as soon as you released it? It took like 10 weeks or something to, to get to number three. It was really slow going up the chart. Yeah. And then we got, and then we, um, got Top of the Pops when it was at number 45, I think. I mean, I don't know how I managed to do that, but as as soon as we'd done up, you know, Top of the Pops performance, it just went completely crazy and my life changed forever at, at that moment. Overnight. Do you remember who you were on Top of the Pops with? <sighs> You know, I no, I don't because because I was so, I was so absolutely nervous. I think Duran Duran were on it and Spandau. I mean, it was a fantastic line lineup. Just looking it up now, and also on your very first Top of the Pops was Culture Club doing Karma Chameleon, who you're now going out touring America with forty years on. Amazing. I wonder what the Howard Jones of forty years ago was thinking as he's watching Culture Club in the Top of the Pop studio, uh, knowing it's his turn next. I'm thinking, oh, you know, do I belong here? And um, a bit of imposter oh, syndrome. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and then you go, well. Yeah, I think I do actually, uh, and um, so yeah. So I mean, you obviously by then you 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 know you you don't you 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 sort of earned your stripes with all the performing that you'd done, as you said, in pubs where no one turns up, and eventually started to build. So you knew what you were doing performance wise, but doing it on television, yeah, is quite a different thing. Doing it on something as surreal as Top of the Pops, which is a weird one, it is. Uh, something else. But what was that like the next day? Were you sort of getting recognised on the bus or in the supermarket? Yeah, I mean. You know, I've been I've been working in a factory, you know, for about eighteen months to to you know to to actually pay for all the you know the music that I was doing and buying equipment and just keeping us going, and and just literally overnight it was like suddenly from only the like my real core fans around High Wycombe who were wonderful and they followed me everywhere, you know, they knew who I was, but then suddenly everyone knew because everyone watched off the pod, didn't they? I mean, yeah. Your mum and your grandmum and everyone watched it, and so you, I couldn't go anywhere anymore um, without being chased by people. <laughs> that was a bit of a shock because I, I, I didn't really know about that. You know, I didn't, I didn't crave that. No, I just, I wanted to do my music, um, but I, I realised quickly that that was something I was going to have to deal with. I remember going into High Wycombe for the first time after doing Top of the Pops and literally about 20 teenagers chased me, you know, back to the, the back to my car. <laughs> You're thinking, what's going on? Karma Chameleon from Culture Club, a band who are going out on tour in the US with Howard Jones and 40 years ago were performing in the studio when he did his very first Top of the Pops. And uh, after that, more often than not, uh, a tour, Howard, is is hastily put together. Yes, we we um, we, we went out on tour with, with the China Crisis because they were doing a national tour, which was so exciting for, for us because... And I say yes because it was a team of, of people that had helped me, you know, get where I, you know, worked yeah. with music and everything. And uh, we were playing all around the country and we were staying in tiny little um, bed and breakfast places because we couldn't afford anything else and we we're travelling in the van. And then, we, you know, um, because the, 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 the record was being played on the radio, when we'd arrive um, at the venue, the audiences knew it, you know, and were going crazy and it was... One of the most exciting times of, of, of my life that was. It was really, um, it was such fun. And I was with my mates, you know, who'd helped me to get there, yeah. you know, and they stayed with me. I mean, even when I was playing um, um, Madison Square Garden, I still had the same team with me. So they they helped to keep my feet on the ground, if you know what I mean, you know, because um, it's people don't realise that actually that's the time when you need friends most. Yes. It, it all goes crazy and you, you, you suddenly, you know, 
some people think, oh, no, they don't need me anymore. I just leave them alone. But actually, that's when you really need your mates. Did you did you have in that sort of initial whoosh of going from unknown to very known and traveling around and touring and going across to the States, did you have a, a sort of a full circle moment? I love these stories where people sort of suddenly find themselves standing next to, chatting to, or even playing alongside heroes that you had from you know your younger days and you think oh, i can't believe this is happening i was really i was really fortunate to meet the, the the people i you know absolutely adored and loved and held up as music gods um, um i remember meeting um david bowie in 85 at, at, at live aid and 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 him oh. knowing first of all knowing who i was and saying to me Oh, I hear you're doing really well in America. <laughs> and so, David, he knows that. <laughs> and, and I thought uh, that was it. And then we um, spent like about an hour talking with Paul McCartney and Linda McCartney and talking about, you know, being a vegetarian and, um, you know, what did we feed our dogs? And, oh. and, and it, was, it, was just, it was just brilliant. I mean, I'm, I'm so fortunate to meet those people. Well, let's talk more about that very special day of Live Aid. It's 38 years ago this week that it took place at Wembley Stadium. Uh, we're celebrating it all week long on our great conversation. So you performed right after Sting and Phil Collins. So no pressure there then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think it can be surpassed. Can it, Howard, in terms of being the most incredible gig ever? I don't, I don't think so, you know, because two billion people watching on TV around the world and then 100,000 people in Wembley Stadium. I mean, and then with like the best lineup you could ever have, uh, uh, you know, in terms of like legendary people playing it. I mean, it was, I, I'm so absolutely pleased that I got to play a small part in that, you know, and do my song. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a wonderful day. I'll never forget it. Never forget that. Was it? I mean, we all have this sort of um, image in our minds of this sort of big, you know, star-studded rock and roll party happening backstage. What was it like? Did it feel very organised? Was it chaotic? You know, were you sharing a dressing room with somebody? Um, it, you know, it, I didn't... I thought it was pretty well organised. It, it, it didn't feel chaotic. I mean, I was due to do two songs. Um, we were going to do another song uh, with my backing singers, um, Aphrodisiac, but... You know, they kind of run out of time. And you, you'd expect that at, at an event like that. But but backstage, um, yeah, I always like telling the story. I mean, the, the, the dressing rooms were, were very, you know, very modest. And so me and my wonderful backing singers um, were like rehearsing the, the other song we were going to do. And it was too small in there. So we came out on the grass and started singing it because it, it was an a cappella thing. It was an a cappella version of Life in One Day. And two people came out of their dressing room to, you know, to sort of see what was going on. And, and one of them was David Bowie and one of them was Pete Townsend from The Who. And you know, the first band I ever saw. And they stood like a couple of metres away, listened to the whole song. And in the end, you know, we never got to do it on the stage. And, but I said to the girls, that was like, this is the best audience you could play to. Just those, those two. <laughs> That'll do. Forget Wembley. Yeah, that's what that'll do. <laughs> I'm doing me forever. Hello. There was a time when there was nothing at all, nothing. Hide and seek Howard Jones live at Live Aid on the 13th of July, 1985. Amazing. Right, so final question, as ever. We're looking for you to pick the final track of the hour, Howard. Uh, we're not so nuts as to ask you to pick your all-time favourite song, but it's a particular song you find yourself revisiting often for a particular reason, whether that's because you could do with cheering up, inspiring, uh, getting jazzed for the day, feeling a bit comforted because you're feeling a bit down. What what song is that for you? I have to say it, it, would, it would be um, John Lennon and Imagine. I know that's probably what a lot of people would choose. But for me, it, it's, I've always tried to, 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 to put messages into my work um, that, that you know, encourage people and inspire people to be their great selves. And, mm. and, and that's the song that does it for me. You know, it's so simply put those, those, those words, but they mean so much. Imagine today. John 
Lennon Imagine, our final track chosen tonight by our special guest Howard Jones. And as well as the ongoing touring, Howard, that we've talked about, you're always writing new material too. Uh, you had a new album out late last year called Dialogue, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I, I keep, I, I, I'm never going to stop making new music because I, my fans, they're so wonderful sticking with me for so, so, you know, 40 years they've stuck with me. It's my pleasure to keep doing new music for them. I'll, I'll keep going as long as my voice holds out, you know, and still sounds <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's the thing. I, I think, you know, you've got to know when it's time to sort of spend more time at home. And honestly, I'm not, I'm not just saying it, but watching you perform at Greatest Hits Radio Live, I mean, it's just, there's just, just no difference, no change. There's no difference. I mean, it just sounds amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I mean, it is something that I've worked on my singing over the so i never thought of myself as a singer you know because obviously i was a keyboard player primarily and then there was nobody yeah. around to sing my song so i thought i'm gonna have to do it i'm gonna, I'm gonna have to learn how to, to do, do this <laughs> um and it's so i've always been a, you know, a bit of paranoia about you know about the actual singing but so i put extra effort into it and i think that's sort of kind of paid off over the years yeah. Oh, Howard, such a pleasure to, to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, for interviewing me, Jackie. It's been, I've really enjoyed it. Howard Jones, lovely chap.